So I say take a pencil out and I'll take you through an example and see if you can keep up with me on the example and see if you uh, can do the calculation uh, using Euclidean distance. So this is, you know, we saw an example in trellis, uh, excuse me, in convolutional coding with the Viterbi algorithm. Took you through all those transitions, gave, went through a couple examples. Well now this is one more example, but now we're going to be using Euclidean distance. And so uh, it's a little bit different, but a little bit the same. So uh, see if you can keep up. So this is coming from an exam question, an old exam question. And it is, suppose that you received symbols with trellis coded modulation, which are minus 5, 1, minus 7, 3. And I said these are soft decisions. Here I am again giving you nice round numbers. It's minus 5. It could have been minus 5.3 uh, because it's a soft decision. So I give you exactly what the coordinates are. It looks like it's a hard decision because it looks like I quantized it and said, you know, I, I, even though with noise it could have fallen anywhere around here, I just said that number. That would be a hard decision, but it's just to keep the numbers round. But Euclidean distance would be the same calculation even if these were not exactly uh, round. So this is the assignment. It's the example, the, the bit sequence assignment to the coordinates of PAM. It's the same convolutional coder, I'm pretty sure, that we saw before. And uh, my uh, task that I give you is, given that this is what you observed as a sequence, tell me what you think was transmitted. What was the bit sequence? But now what is the symbol sequence? Because you're going to say it was symbol minus 5, symbol 1, symbol minus 7, symbol 3. Now I want you to tell me which is the uh, bit sequence that was sent. And uh, we'll, we'll go through it using the uh, Euclidean distance. So what's the first step? First step is we use the encoder. And it, it is indeed the same example that I used earlier. And so we have the bit sequence assignment, we have the convolutional encoder, and from that we get our uh, encoding uh, trellis with the double rails for TCM. And again, we're looking at the decoder part, so we're looking at the, the algorithm that would be done in the uh, TCM decoder. So the first thing I did was that I took this and said 0, 0, 0. I looked here, uh, 0, 0, 0, that's a 7. And so I wrote a 7 up there in that uh, decoder, uh, trellis, decoding trellis. And here, where it says 1, 0, 0, I looked at it and said uh, 0, I'm sorry, 1, 0, 0, that's here. 1, 0, 0 is minus 1. So I wrote a minus 1 next to it. And I did that for each one of the double rails in this trellis. I just wrote next to each one of the sequences what is the coordinate that's assigned to that sequence. Really, this is the encoder. I take the output of the encoder. This is what should be transmitted for the output of this encoder. So the next step is I build a trellis. And in the trellis, well, I have to put two numbers because I have two numbers on each one of these rails. So when I'm building my decoding trellis, at each transition, I'm going to put an ordered pair. And the ordered pair is, the first one in the ordered pair is what corresponds to the, if the first sequence, the first uncoded bit in the sequence was a zero. And in the second entry in the ordered pair would be the coordinate if the uncoded bit was a one. So every transition has coordinates, and then I put them in this order, uh, 0, 1. So I just build my decoder trellis in that way. You know, all of the transitions, you know, it gets a little crowded, but I didn't write them for the ones here. But of course, this one is, again, 7 minus 1. This one is, of course, again, uh, 3 minus 5, etc. So uh, I have the information there for the, the whole trellis. So now I have to decode. How do I decode? Well, I look at what was received. Here's what was received. So it was received a minus 5, a 1, a minus 7, and a 3. Um, so I want you to go through the exercise of using the uh, decoder to find out uh, what the output would be. 
So the first step I do is I have to calculate a branch metric. So how do I do that? Well, this is 7 minus 1, but what I measured was minus 5. So I have to calculate what's the different distance between minus 5 and 7. Minus 5 and 7 are 12 apart, so that becomes 12. Here's minus 5 and minus 1. How far apart is minus, minus 5 and minus 1? They're 4 apart. I have to do this for every transition in this time period. Uh, since we've initialized, always starting at uh, state 0, 0, there's only one more transition that's possible, because I know I was at state A, so either I stay at A or I go down to B. So this is 3 minus 5 to 3, uh, that's distance A, and minus 5 to minus 5. You know, we know that was what's transmitted, but I, I didn't bother putting in noise just to make this example easier. But uh, in any case, we get a nice zero distance here. This is the branch metric. I do the same thing in the next time period. So here, um, the distance between 1 and 7, that's a 6. Between 1 and minus 1, that's a 2. So I have a 6 and a 2, ordered pair. Very important, always keep the order straight. And I do that for all of the transitions. There's four transitions in this uh, time interval, and so I calculate for each one of them. And we go again, the next time interval. Now my coefficients is minus 7. And the distance between minus 7 and 7, well, that's 14. And the distance between, and what was the other coordinate? I forgot already, it was minus 1. The distance between minus 7 and minus 1 is 6. And again, I keep doing that for every one of the transitions. And I do it again. So the first step is calculating the branch metrics. Of course, if I was a computer, <laughs> I would be doing them as I went. But now, to explain it to you what's going on, I just think of it as one step. I go through and I calculate all of the branch metrics. And now having calculated the branch metrics, uh, it's time to start making decisions about transitions. The first transition that we have to worry about is the uncoded one. So it's not even really a transition. A transition means I go from A to A. So I've gone to A to A, but I have two choices. So the first decision I make is the one that has no coding, just based on these two things are far apart. I'm going to pick the distance that's smaller as being the more likely one, and the larger one is not likely, so I'm going to forget that. Remember, remember, if I go back, the first number in the ordered pair was if the uncoded bit was a zero. So I have to keep track of, even though I'm going to throw away that 12, because I don't care about that 12, I do care about the position. It's not the, I'm throwing away the zero uncoded, and I'm keeping the one uncoded. So now the next part will be to see that one uncoded you know, what are the other two bits associated with it? And then I'm going to use uh, the rest of my calculations to help me with this. But when I'm going through, I just take each one of these ordered pairs, and I look within the ordered pair, what's the smallest one? That one I keep. The one that's bigger, I don't keep, because that's not going to happen. So I put an x through it. I throw away the number, because I don't need that number anymore. It's bigger than 0. That's the only thing I need. I get rid of it. I need the 0 because it tells me uh, some distance. So I go through and I strike them out. Of course, sometimes I get the same one. doesn't matter. Uh, I could strike out either one of them. But I'm very careful not to throw away the information about which position it was in. So I know it was a second position I kept in both of these cases. Um, so now I've done my first pruning in my uh, trellis, and that was within the double rail. So now all of the double rails have been resolved to a single rail. Um, there's one value in each one of them. And, but I keep the information about what that choice was. So now I have branch metrics. I've trimmed my double rail to a single rail. And the next step is to start calculating path metrics. So the first um, path metric or global distance that I'm going to be uh, calculating is will be for the arriving in state A. And of course when I calculate this distance it will be the first one squared plus the second one squared. So I get 16 plus 4 and that gives me 20. So this distance squared is 20. I don't have to take the square root because I'll always be comparing squared distances and, and uh, so the square root is 
uh, just to be exact in the calculation, but for our comparisons, we can keep the square. Uh, here in this one, it was 4 squared plus 2 squared. It gives me 20 again. Here I've got 0, and then for this transition, 4, either one, doesn't matter. That gives me 16. And here I have a 0 and a 0, so the total distance of 0. I don't have to make any decisions yet about whether it was the upper path or the lower path because I haven't gotten into steady state yet. I'm still at the initialization. But so now I have these transitions as being, you know, the possibilities uh, so far to get there. Now I'm getting into steady state. I have a whole bunch of new um, um, uh, branch metrics. And now I have to create new uh, distance squared path metrics. So this is already the distance squared already here, right? Because we said that uh, the Euclidean distance would be the sum over the z minus u um, squared. And it would be all of these. So what I'm doing is, as I'm going, I'm just keeping the square. <laughs> and now I'm going to add a new square and just keep, keep keeping the square, square of the uh, Euclidean distance. Uh, and of course, at the end, I should take the square. But for now, I had 20, which is already the squared one. And if I look at the upper path, let's make a calculation here, always looking at the upper path for each one of these destination states. So here, taking the upper path, the branch metric was 6. So I had 20, and I add to that 6 squared, and I get 56. Now, for state B, again, looking at the upper path. So I look at the path here to get to B. From the upper path, I came from A. So at A, the previous distance was 20. The distance squared was 20. Now I add to that the branch metric squared, so 2 squared, that's 4, and I get a total of 24. Again, the upper path from state C came from B, where I had a square distance of 20. I add 4 squared, I get 36. And again, state D from the upper path. I was coming from the same state B, same value of 20, but now my transition is 0, so I get 20. Now I have to do another calculation, but now I'm always looking at the lower branch, so the other uh, point of entry for the state. And so in this case, from state A, if I look at the lower branch, I had come from a total of 16 for the distance squared previously, and now this transition has a branch metric of 2, so I get uh, 16 plus, excuse me, I'm up here, aren't I? Um, previous one was 16 or 4 squared, and now I add to that 2 squared, and I get 20. And now for state B, coming from the lower path, so I'm coming from 16 again, but now I'm adding a branch metric of 6, so 16 plus 6 squared, that gives me 52. If I look at state C, uh, again, the lower branch came from a previous distance of 0 and a new distance of 0, so total distance of 0. And the last one, the calculation becomes 16. So remember the Viterbi algorithm, it's always add, whoops, add, compare, select. So now we've done the addition. We've come up with two uh, distances. And now we have to compare. So we compare 20 and 56, and we say 20 is lower. And so we say that we are going to keep the lower branch. We compared them. The lower branch was smaller, so we keep the lower branch. We also trim. So here I am at state A. I said keep the lower branch. So if I go back this transition, I get rid of because uh, that's not being kept. I only keep the lower one. Now, if I look at, um, I do the same thing, compare, select at each one of the states. So at this state B, I could compare the upper path with smaller, 24, than 52. So here I'm going to keep the upper path, and I'm going to prune out the lower path. So I'm keeping this upper path, but the lower path has disappeared. Comparing 36 and 0, I'm going to keep, again, the lower path, prune the upper path, so just the lower path is kept. And in the last one, the lower path was, was sooner. So what gets stored in memory during my Viterbi decoding? Well, at this point, as I'm chugging along in time, 
for state A, I will keep the path here. And I will keep for state B the path here. And for all of them, I will also keep the branch metric just to there. So that's what's stored in memory at this point. Then I go on to the next set of calculation. I do the exact same thing. I calculate the, uh, the global distance or the path metric um, by uh, doing a sum for the upper path and for the lower path. And then I compare the two, and I declare which one is the winning path, and I keep that here. Now, in this example, you know, there were no errors. So I could have, you know, not used the encoder. But um, let's uh, just keep these nice round numbers and uh, look here and say, well, which path was the winning path? And clearly, if I had to choose now, this has got the smallest distance. So I think that this is the path that I should keep. So the winning path is the path with the smallest distance. So I say it's the one that ends here at A. So it's this one is the one that I'm going to keep. And I'm going to get rid of these others because, you know, get rid of them because I made my choice which path was the most likely path. So you'll remember that the original question was not uh, show me the path that wins, it was tell me the bit sequence that was transmitted based on your passage through the trellis. So if this is our final result, in order to write what is the um, bit sequence that was sent, well I need two things. I need in my trellis, you know, I have the dotted line and I have the solid line, uh, which is going to tell me about the coded bit. These transitions are based on which coded bit was transmitted. But which one of the ordered pair was retained tells me about the first bit. So here I have, you know, a dotted line, and so I see here on the second bit I have a 1. So that's because of this dotted line I see this 1. Here I have a dotted line, and that's why I have a 1 here. Now these are solid lines, and the solid line corresponded to a coded bit of 0. So this solid line gives me this 0 for the second one. And this solid line tells me that the second bit uh, was a 0. Now, to know what the first bit was, it depends on which of the ordered pair I retained. And so here, I retained the second one. And the second one means that it was a 1 that was not coded. And in this transition, it's the first entry in the ordered pair that was kept. And that corresponds to a 0 as the um, uh, uncoded bit. Again, second position means 1. First position means 0. And so by looking at the trellis, dotted line, solid line tells me the coded bit. And the position of the ordered pair tells me the first not coded bit.